Friday the 13th, Church of the Divine Psychopath, Chapter 9. Jason Voorhees stood at the head of the room, the cross teetering at his back and the screaming, cowering congregation spread out before him like a salad bar of murderous possibilities. Eyeing the machete on the floor, he hurled Mark Brody's head aside and bent to pick up the familiar edged weapon. Brody's head, a death mask of agony, hit the wall with a wet thwack, leaving a gory stain as it bounced away finally rolling to a stop at the feet of Curtis Rickles. Rickles stared into Brody's blood-smeared dead eyes. He'd seen a lot of nasty shit during his days in the Corps, but none of it had ever made him want to piss his pants and run like this did. Rickles tore his gaze from Brody's lifeless eyes just in time to see Jason striding towards him, drawing that machete back, ready to take a swing. The ex-Marine made a move to dive out of the way, but slipped in the blood that oozed from the stump of Brody's neck, and crashed through the first row of folding metal chairs. Coming up in a noisy tangle, with the seats and stained with Brody's sticky blood, Rickles watched as Jason stopped, slowly turned his head to side in on his target once more, and came towards him again. That's when Rickles really did piss his pants. Following Kelly's lead, numerous other God-fearing church folk had hightailed it for some place less deadly, but amazingly, others still remained in their seats, believing themselves to be witnessing the will of God fulfilled right there in front of them in gory color and 3D. These folks simply stared in silence as Jason Voorhees closed in on Curtis Rickles, ready to see how he'd fare when faced with the Lord's judgment. Father Long, too, merely watched as his good right hand quelled before the hand of God. Don James had jumped through the window that the generator cables fed through, smashing through the glass and wood without concern for the multiple lacerations he suffered in doing so. A couple other men had followed him, getting off a little easier thanks to James's initial clearing of the way. Frantically, Rickles fought to extricate himself from the folding seats. Jason took a swipe at him with the machete, the blade glancing off one of the chairs but still taking a chunk of meat out of Rickles' right forearm. Rickles howled in pain. Freeing his left arm, he snatched up a chair and flung it awkwardly at Jason. The edge of the chair smashed into the killer's hockey mask, scarring the hard plastic and clattering to the floor. Other than to snap his head back, the impact had no discernible effect on Jason himself. Get, get the fuck away from me! Rickles shrieked, clutching his wounded arm and trying to crawl away from Jason. Those members of the congregation who had remained in their seats knew that that kind of language wasn't going to help Mr. Rickles cause at all. A second folding chair bounced off of Jason's barrel-like torso, this one thrown by Roger, or was it Robert? Don't interfere! Father Long yelled at the would-be hero. His attention diverted from Rickles for a moment. Jason turned to face this new challenger, seizing the opportunity and not giving a goddamn what happened to the man who had helped him. Rickles quickly kicked himself loose from the last of the chairs. Slipping and sliding in all the blood, he scuttled away on all fours back towards Father Long. Roger, or Robert, stared in shock as Jason stomped towards him, kicking metal chairs from his path. Pausing, the resurrected mass murderer found himself distracted by the assortment of potential victims surrounding him. In particular, Meredith Host, who was screaming at the top of her rather attractive lungs and tugging at her father's arm in vain effort to make him leave from Jason's killing ground. Daddy! Meredith shrieked, straining to pull the man from the seat. Please, 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 Daddy, come on! Unmoved by his daughter's appeals, Mr. Host maintained a firm grip on his wife's hand. They both stared vacantly as the heavenly vessel moved beyond reason by this vision of spiritual justice being played out before them. Prioritizing his victims, Jason raised his machete and viciously slashed at Roger, or Robert, cutting a gaping 14-inch gash in the man's chubby midsection from right shoulder to navel. While Roger, or Robert, watched his intestines begin to slide forth from the bloody wound, Jason pushed his way towards the hosts. Mommy, please! Meredith cried. She heard a loud, wet splat and looked over to see a large pile of Roger, or Robert's, guts hit the floor. They were followed closely by Roger, or Robert, himself. It's going to be just fine, honey, Mr. Host said, not taking his eyes off the approaching figure of Jason Voorhees. Meredith watched Jason push the last few chairs that separated him from the host out of the way. Her eyes followed the machete blade as he raised it high. I'm a sinner, Meredith screamed into her father's ears. I have lust in my heart, Daddy. Do you hear me? Meredith's father looked calmly up at his daughter. Then you must kneel and be judged. 
He was interrupted as the blade of Jason's machete sank deeply into his skull, cleaving his face like a Sunday ham. Meredith screamed one last time as she saw her father's left eyeball ooze from the socket and slide down the machete blade, leaving a gooey snail trail behind it. The disgorged eyeball came to a stop, resting against the back of Jason's rotted hand. Leaving her mother to face her fate alone, Meredith ran like hell for the door. She paused, looking back just as Jason transferred the machete to his left hand and flicked Mr. Host's eyeball from the right. Then he drove the blade through her mother's chest, the tip ringing off the back of her metal chair as it exited past her spinal cord. Meredith was out the door and down the steps before her mother's body could tumble to the floor. The girl, nubile and shapely teenager that she was, was doubtless Jason's prime choice for victimhood, but Meredith, Meredith's hasty exit still left the killer a number of suitable victims. Charlotte Rutherford and Denise Keenan huddled together on the floor near the wall. Jason made his way towards the women, stepping on Roger, or Roberts, copious innards as he went. Something that may have been yesterday's supper spurted from the ropey strands of intestine. Three members of the congregation still held their seats and watched the show, apparently willing to stay until the final whistle. Other than them, only Father Long, Rickles, Charlotte, and Denise remained in the cabin. Father! Rickles wearily called to Long. He held his left hand pressed tightly to the machete wound on his right forearm, but the blood was practically hosing out with every beat of the man's heart. Long, mesmerized by the sight of Jason stalking the two obvious sinners groveling on the floor, didn't hear or didn't want to hear. Father! Rickles yelled. He thought he might pass out at any moment. Long turned to shoot him an ice-cold stare. Rickles had seen the look dozens of times in combat. The man had clearly lost his grip. I think it's time we left! The preacher started to admonish Rickles, but the ex-marine cut him off. To gather the congregation so we can reward the faithful for passing judgment. Come on. Father Long considered the man's words. A scream erupted from the other side of the room. Long and Rickles looked to see Charlotte Rutherford's body being hoisted in the air on Jason's machete. As the woman struggled and shrieked, her body slid down the length of the blade, bringing her face to face with her killer. Taking hold of her hair, Jason cruelly twisted the blade, then ripped it through the woman's side. He dropped the corpse to the floor and bent down towards Denise Keenan. A uh, yes, Long said distractedly. He turned back to face Rickles. Perhaps we should go. Rickles helped the preacher through the broken window, then painfully clambered out himself as he tumbled into the dirt outside. Denise's screaming became a gurgle and then was suddenly cut off. Kelly's nagging guilt over leaving Meredith behind began to get the better of her. She skidded to a halt and looked back towards the cafeteria. People... Dark shapes silhouetted against what light there was were spilling from the cabin, running in all directions, disappearing again in the shadows. Maybe one of them was Meredith. Maybe she did get away. She gave a moment's thought to going back and looking for the girl, but the ghastly screams coming from within the building spurred her on. She started running again. Jason Voorhees. She'd grown up on spooky bedtime stories about the relentless killer who only preyed on sluts and dopers, figuring it was just a legend something parents told their kids in a pathetic attempt to keep them out of trouble. Like La Lorana, or that Kruger guy with the knives on his fingers. Then, as she got older, she started seeing stories on the news and she knew Jason Voorhees was real, and now she was running from him. Kelly rounded the main building and fell down, scuffing the palms of her hands in the dirt. No, 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 you do not fall down when you're running from the killer, she told herself. Grunting, she pushed herself to her feet and took off again. Kelly had no idea where she was heading. She only knew that she had to run. What was she doing? She couldn't run all the way back to town. She already felt like she was going to have a heart attack. She ran out across the parking area. The school bus, the scout, and Rickle's old pickup truck were all there. But she ignored them. No keys, and she wasn't exactly Josie the juvenile delinquent. So hot wiring one of the vehicles was out of the question. She'd seen it done in movies, but she'd also seen movies about women who could maintain satisfying relationships, and she didn't know how to do that either. Kelly paused, resting her elbows on her knees to catch her breath for a second. People were still screaming back at the cafeteria building. The church. What a sick joke. They're dying, and I'm leaving them. And she was probably the biggest sinner of the bunch. The irony of it all made her want to puke. She looked out across Crystal Lake. The moonlight shimmered on the water's surface, sending long 
crooked fingers of yellow-orange reaching towards her. How many goddamn morons had came here over the years, knowing about the murders that had happened. And they just kept on coming. People are so fucking stupid, Kelly thought. Myself included. But wait a second. The moon was straight overhead. Those lights on the water were coming from the other side of the lake. Somebody had a camp set up over there. The soldiers. It had to be the soldiers. Kelly raced down to the water's edge, running as fast as her legs would carry her. Meredith's, Meredith's set wedged on the floor, underneath the old writing desk in the cabin she and her parents lived in, clutching her knees to her chest and staring at the door. The room was dark. The screams from the church, except she didn't want to call it a church anymore, stuff like mass murder and mutilation doesn't happen in a church, had finally ceased a few minutes ago. In a way, the ensuing quiet was even scarier. No one else had returned to their cabins. She knew her mom and dad weren't coming back. She saw what Jason Voorhees had done to them. But where were the other families? Dead? Were all of them dead? What if everyone was dead? Meredith shuddered. If they were all dead, that meant she was alone in the camp, alone with Jason Voorhees. She whispered a little prayer, then stopped. What good would it do? What good had it done her parents? Jason had slaughtered them like animals. And they certainly weren't sinners. She knew they weren't. They, they were good people. As for Father Long, Meredith began to pray again. Long had taken enough from her already. There was no way she was going to let him rob her of her faith. She prayed for her mother and father and for everyone else Jason had killed. Not just from the ministry, but everyone, all his victims. And she prayed for Kelly. Kelly. Oh God, maybe she was still alive. Meredith hadn't seen her when everything went crazy. It didn't mean she wasn't in the cafeteria when Meredith ran for her life, but think... Girl, think. Meredith squeezed her eyes shut, trying to remember when she had last seen Kelly. When she closed the door, before Jason came to life and started killing everybody, Kelly had been standing by the door. Then she must have gotten out. Maybe I can find her, Meredith thought, starting to scoot out from under the desk. Then she caught herself. How, she, how could she go outside? Jason was still out there. Meredith felt paralyzed, not wanting to stay in the cabin alone, but terrified of going out into the dark. Her shoulders shook, and she blurted out a single, quavering sob, then fought it down. I don't want to cry again. He might hear. What was it Kelly had told her to imagine when she got scared at night? Meredith smiled. Kelly had told her she heard a lot of squirrels at night, especially when she had to pee really bad, and no one else was awake to go to the bathroom with her. Where was everyone? Would, would Kelly really run off and leave her? Maybe if Meredith had made her mad enough when she grabbed her boob... It was so wrong, she knew, but she couldn't stand it. She just wanted to kiss her. Kelly's lips looked so soft, and they were always shiny, like she was born with perfect lip gloss glazed permanently across her mouth. And her little tummy was so round and cute, eyes clothing, her breathing shaky. Meredith reached out her trembling left hand and dreamily caressed the imaginary curve of Kelly's abdomen in the air. Her tongue flicked out to wet her lips, and her right hand crept towards the warm place between her legs. Suddenly, her eyes snapped open. What is wrong with me? Sniffling, Meredith glanced around, embarrassed. Bam! Whirling, Meredith turned towards the sound, looking up at the window behind. Someone was looking back at her. Element leader Chris Seaver viciously yanked at Samantha Noon's short black hair like he was tugging the veins on a galloping horse. Fuck! She hissed, spittle flying from her lips. With a resonant thwack, Sleever slapped the woman on her bare ass, watching the plump flesh undulate as he took her from behind. Noon let out a, gr a gruff squill. A half hour earlier, Chris Seaver had his comrade-at-arms, the lovely Miss Noon, had slipped away from the rest of the strike team and ventured near the shore of Crystal Lake, where they had proceeded to peel one another from their cumbersome uniforms. Now, in a small clearing within the trees and undergrowth, they were expressing their rather hearty feelings for each other in a way that even the basest animals might find disconcerting. Harder, you fuck, she snarled. It was only his grip on her scruffy locks that prevented him from disengaging and tumbling back into the bushes. Yo, trick, you almost knocked me out of ya. Seaver bent towards and zestfully bit the woman's left shoulder in what could almost have passed as a loving gesture. You are my delicate French pudding, he purred tenderly. His tongue flicked across her earlobe. Then he smacked her on the ass again, eliciting a guttural snarl of pleasure. Noon roared as a wave of pleasure soared through her. With one arm wrapped around a tree, she reached up with the other and snagged what she could of Seaver's close-cropped blonde hair. 
and most of his ear with it. She yanked his head down and, plant, and planted the sloppy, open-mouthed kiss on him, drooling down his chin in the process. Then Kelly Mills burst through the trees, doing a double-take as she ran past the two. Holy shit! Noon yelped upon sight of the woman. Springing upright, she assumed a fighting stance. Kelly came to a lurching stop, her eyes instantly falling upon Seaver's nether regions. Oh my god, she yelled, turning away. Seaver just stood there for a moment, dumbfounded. Then he clasped his hands in front of himself. Who the fuck are you? Noon demanded, her fist raised in front of her. What are you doing out here? Kelly risked a glance at the nude, sweat-slathered woman who was bobbing around like an Amazonian prize fighter. Ridiculously, Kelly put her hands up as if someone were holding a gun on her. I don't know. I mean, I heard someone and... God damn right you heard someone, Noon said. I recognize her. She, she's from the church, Seaver said. That's right. Kelly spun towards him, then looked skyward, embarrassed by his nudity. Remembering to cover his ass with his hands, Seaver bent and fished around in the dark until he came up with his pants. It figures fucking church folk would be sneaking around trying to watch people get it on. Noon lowered her fist, standing brazenly naked in front of Kelly, who did her best not to look. What are you doing here, spying? No, Kelly snapped, collecting herself. She tried to explain. They, I think, I think a lot of people are dead over there. Noon stepped forward, thrusting her chin towards Kelly's face. Spill, she commanded, her teeth tightly clenched. Kelly took a few breaths, not sure how to continue. Do you, do you know who Jason Voorhees is? Seaver and Noon swapped a look. A satisfied smirk tugged at Noon's lips. Man, oh man, Hob thought. Were his instincts on the money or what? He knew there was something weird going on at Long's Woodland Church. And, from what this woman was telling them, it sounded like all hell was breaking loose over there. He thought he'd heard screams earlier, but since he wasn't exactly a forest-dwelling guy, he figured them to be call of some kind of bird, or maybe Samantha Noon, but he didn't want to give Seaver the credit for being able to elicit that much wailing from a woman. After Chris Seaver and Samantha Noon had brought Kelly into Strike Team's camp, she had collapsed in tears. From what she had told them, Hob was amazed she wasn't in shock. Jesus Christ, Jason Voorhees resurrected before her eyes and going on a killing spree? He had felt guilty at first for not acting on his suspicions when the team had been at Camp Crystal Lake earlier. But really, what could he have done? Dragging the woman out of there in front of Long and all his cohorts? That would have gone over great. Of course, it might have prevented whatever happened over there. Shit. All he needed was another one of the miserable fuck-ups to live with. Leaning back against one of the labs, Hob watched as Jeff Townsend talked to the woman, trying to calm her enough so he could keep her talking, wring every drop of potential intel out of her. Hob had to hand it to his friend. The guy was good. Holding Kelly's hand, brushing the hair back from her tear-streaked face, the sympathetic way he spoke to her. Jeff seemed to have genuine affection and concern for the gr girl. Somebody like Seaver would have just screamed at her to get the information he wanted. Hob looked at Seaver, who knelt at the back of another lav, prepping the operations for an insertion into Camp Crystal Lake. Seeing Samantha Noon standing over her sweetie pie, her face still flushed from the underpants polka they'd surely been doing, Hob couldn't help but think that insertions were the only thing on Seaver's mind. Somewhere just beyond the lights of the camp, a branch cracked in the forest. Hob instantly shouldered his FN MK-46 machine gun, while, a, while around him a variety of weapons were leveled at the trees surrounding the team. Bright red beams of laser lights crossed in the darkness over the operators sought a target. Come on out, Hob wild. Come on out and let's get this over with. Moments passed, not another sound. Slowly the team returned to their positions. Ortega, Hurley... Leonard and Ashasin continued to stand watch, their weapons at the ready. Seaver approached Hob. When we go in, you're staying here, he said, deliberately pitching his voice for the other team members to hear. He cocked his head towards Kelly. Thought you might like to babysit. Chris Seaver had about four inches height on Hob, and he hated looking up at the asswipe more than just about anything he could think of at the moment. You know, Hob said, Jason likes to kill people who have sex. Seaver sneered. Then I guess you better keep your hands off her sweet little ass while we're gone. He stepped closer to Hob, getting in his face, trying to back him down. Hob held his ground, the muscles in his jaw tightening. 
I'm not going to punch him in the face, he told himself, as much as I'd love to. Instead, he merely widened his blood-red eyes, staring intently up at Seaver. Do me a favor while you're out there, will you? If you hear a noise, why don't you just go wander off by yourself to investigate? He gave Seaver a quick wink with the bloody eye. That's a classic maneuver from what I hear. Seaver! Jeff Townsend snapped. The element leader turned towards his commanding officer. Accidentally jostling Hobb with an elbow. Less hat up, we've got work to do. Seaver moved to assemble the team. Hobb sighed deeply, grateful to be rid of the man. Still holding Kelly's hand, Townsend got to his feet. It was like watching King Kong le leaning over Fay Ray, Hobb thought. We're going to take care of this, Miss Mills, Townsend assured the girl. Meanwhile, you'll be in good hands. He smiled at Hobb. Keep an eye on Kelly while we're gone, Walt, or you'll answer to me. Are you sure she wants my eye on her? Hobb asked, displaying his eight-ball hemorrhage for the girl. He was hoping for a laugh, but instead she just looked alarmed. Would you rather I take him along? Townsend asked Kelly. She shook her head and smiled a little, appreciative of the attempt to cheer her up. Releasing her hand, Townsend walked over and knocked fists with Hobbs. I'm taking 15 men. You'll be here with Leonard, Hurley, Ortega, and Atchison. That should be plenty of firepower, but even then, you all might want to get into one of the labs and lock the fucking door, he said soberly. In fact, consider that an order. So you're really leaving me here to cool my heels? I thought you had a little faith in me, man. You know I'd rather be doing this differently, Townsend said, but I'm already in some serious shit with Lauren, and if you get all sliced and diced, then I'm up shit creek where that woman's concerned. So under the circumstances, Hobb nodded. He knew it went way beyond that. The other operators didn't trust him, and Townsend didn't want to make things any worse by taking him along. All right, but watch your ass out there, King Size. For the first time he could remember, Hobb was genuinely scared. This wasn't some bunch of loser drug dealers or a deranged husband holding a gun on his kids or even any of the truly weird shit he'd faced since joining the agency. This was fucking madness on the hoof. Everybody knew the stories about Jason Voorhees. Unstoppable, unkillable. Hobb forced a smile for his buddy. Unless he cuts you up into little pieces, we'd never find a coffin to fit you anyhow. If his voice hadn't cracked, nobody ever would have guessed he was close to crapping himself. Just a fucking douchebag with a machete, Townsend said. I'll bring you his hockey mask. He clapped Hobb on the shoulder and trotted away, joining the 15 operators who would accompany him. They piled in through the back hatch of one of the labs, and within seconds, the massive vehicle's engine thundered to life. Hobb jumped as Kelly's hands closed on his upper arm. She looked at him plaintively. I just want to stay close to you, okay? He stared at her for a second. Yeah, he said softly. The word swallowed up by the noise of the lab's engine. Looking away from Kelly, he watched as the armored transport jerked into gear and rumbled away into the night, its lights flickering through the trees. Then all that was left was the low rumble of the engines, slowly as the vehicle headed for Camp Crystal Lake. Chapter 10 Meredith had screamed for what seemed like forever, then the figure at the window darted away and she could hear it moving outside, and then the cabin door swung open. And Curtis Rickles stood there. His right arm was wrapped in a blood-soaked bandage, and he held a hunting rifle in his left hand. He still wasn't wearing his dentures, and Meredith could see a streak of blood smearing across his toothless gums as he spoke. For God's sake, quiet down, girl! He quickly moved through the shadowy cabin to kneel beside her. As much as Meredith disliked and even feared the man, she couldn't stop herself from flinging her arms around his neck and squeezing him tightly. Her tears moistened the collar on his shirt. Is everyone else dead? Meredith said, her face buried in his neck. He smelled sour, almost like an old diaper, but she was too scared to let go. Mr. Rickles lifted his hand and hesitantly stroked her hair. No, they're all in the main house, the ones who, the ones who got out. He dropped the rifle to the floor and embraced Meredith, crushing her against him. That was when she felt the dampness of his jeans and realized what the smell was. The man had wet his pants. She released her grip on him, but had to squirm a bit before he got the hint and finally let go of her. The trip to the main house had been terrifying. She knew Mr. Rickles used to be a Marine, and he kept his gun at the ready the whole time they were running. But she was sure she had seen the bulky figure of Jason standing behind some trees, watching them. She was sure she had seen that mask disappear into the darkness. 
and Mr. Rickles was slow because of his screwed-up left foot, the one he'd hurt back when he was still in the military. They'd made it, though. Meredith sat on the floor in the big room of the main house with everybody else crowded around. Somebody had even made coffee. She wanted to find out who it was so she could scream at them for being so stupid trying to make things normal. There was nothing normal about any of this. There never had been. Her parents. What was wrong with them? How had they been so foolish? She was stung by a pang of guilt. What was wrong with them was that they were dead. They had trusted Father Long. Everybody had. And they were all paying for it. Meredith sipped bitterly from her cup and looked around at the others as they enjoyed their tea party. Mr. Rickles stood near the front window, still holding his rifle and pulling the curtains aside to peer out into the darkness. The wound on his arm was obviously still bleeding badly. Somebody should sew that up, she thought. Don James held a sim similar guard post at another window. He was cut up some himself, from going out the window back in the cafeteria, but none of his wounds appeared to be too bad. Meredith's eyes traveled the room, moving from one blank, stunned face to the next, trying to sort out who was missing. Why was it so hard to figure out? She didn't see Denise, and she knew what had happened to Mr. Brody, of course. Besides her mom and dad, who else was gone? That chubby man who liked Kelly. Where was Kelly? Kelly! Meredith got to her feet, looking frantically around the room. I is Kelly here? Honey, Mr. Rickles began. No, Meredith shouted. People turned towards her with mystified expressions, as if she were speaking a foreign language. Meredith grabbed the closest person, Patricia Crinkle, and, and shook her. Where's Kelly? Meredith shrieked into the woman's dull gaze. Hey now, Manny Creakle, Patricia's husband softly rebuked. There's no need for that sort of thing. Ignoring him, Meredith's eyes swept the room again, desperate. I is there anyone upstairs? Just me. Meredith spun towards the pleasant voice. Father Long was slowly, majestically making his way down the stairs, like he was about to meet his date for the prom. Meredith's mouth fell open. The man had actually taken the time to freshen up. His skin looked pink and scrubbed, his hair neatly combed and still damp from the shower. He wore a crisp, button-down shirt and clean slacks. What are you? How could you? Meredith began, her words trailing off. She didn't even know where to start. Father Long fixed the girl with a sympathetic look. I'm so very sorry, child. I'm afraid Kelly didn't make it. Meredith stared at him, anger rising within her. She wasn't a child, and she wasn't stupid. She did, too. I'm sorry, Long said, continuing down the stairs. She had to, Meredith snapped. She got away. She was, she was by the door when Jason came to life. Can anyone truly escape the hand of God if they are unclean in spirit? Reaching the bottom of the stairs, the father stood in front of Meredith, looking at her as if she were a five-year-old whose hamster had died. I had my concerns about her all along, you know, that she wasn't uh, righteous in her heart. Meredith felt her teeth grinding together. After all, Long continued, the girl had lived, well, let's just call it a rather full life. She lacked a moral compass, and the good Lord, in his wisdom, simply didn't approve of that sort of behavior. Meredith slapped Father Long, the impact snapping his head to the side. When he turned to look at her again, his gaze had gone cold. An angry crimson handprint adorned the left cheek. You're lucky, you know, Long calmly told the girl. She would have led you down the same path. What about my parents, you asshole? My mom and dad weren't righteous enough, huh? Right? They never did anything bad in their lives. Language, honey, Long smiled patronizingly. Apparently, you were mistaken. You saw what happened in the church. The heavenly vessel stood before your parents, and they were judged to be unclean. This is not the time to lie to ourselves when our hearts know otherwise, girl. We can only conclude that your mother and father had committed vile sins against the Lord. Furiously, Meredith flung herself at Long, but was captured by Rickles before she could reach the preacher. The ex-marine struggled to restrain the girl, her fist and feet flailing wildly. Let me go! Rickles pressed his lips to her ear, whispering, Gentle down, darling, he coaxed. Gentle down now, this won't help anything. Meredith continued to struggle. Long held that smile plastered across his face, but took a couple steps back. 
just for safety's sake. Please, honey, Rickles said. We're all in the same boat here. Let's not rock it. Exhausted by everything she'd been through, and with her momentary fury spent, Meredith relaxed in Rickles' grip. The ex-Marine availed himself of the opportunity to nuzzle her hair, inhaling the girl's scent and smiling. She bristled but was too weak to fight him off. What would your parents think if they saw you now, young lady? Father Long scolded Meredith. Swearing, fighting, disrespecting your elders. He gave his head a sad little shake. They may have been judges as sinner in God's eyes, but they raised you better than that, I think. You killed them, Meredith hissed. No, Long said, gazing at her intently. I freed them. Freed their souls so they might find salvation. He stepped forward, still clutching Meredith tightly, her feet dangling above the floor. Curtis Rickles moved aside, allowing the preacher to enter the big room. The surviving members of the congregation looked expectantly to their shepherd. Long gestured towards Meredith. This young girl is obviously in need of further spiritual guidance. I'll have to see to that, he added thoughtfully. In fact, her salvation is the duty of every one of us. Meredith caught the quick glance Father Long shot towards Rickles, who smiled in return. But what about the rest of us? Susan Perkins asked. The rest of you have passed the first test. Falling into his practice routine, Long began slowly pacing as he addressed his followers, considering his words very carefully. Those of us who were uh, heaviest with sin have been struck down. We here in this room have been given a second chance. Don't be fooled. There are still sinners among us. He whirled dramatically, pointing at each and every member of the flock in turn. Of this I have no doubt. And so I implore you to shun the black web of lies your sins will weave. Face the truth and know in your heart that you must cleanse your soul or face the merciless judgment of the heavenly vessel. Sickened by what she was hearing, Meredith stared at everyone who had crammed into the room. They all gazed reverently at Father Long. How did he do it? What did the man have that allowed him to sway those people into believing something that was so completely insane? Fear. That had to be the answer. Not fear of Long, but fear of God. Fear of what awaited them on the other side. Rickles was still holding her up off the floor. Feeling uncomfortable and foolish, Meredith whispered to the man, Please, put me down. I won't fight you anymore. She could feel the man's entire body relax. Rickles allowed the girl to slip through his arms, obvious, obviously relishing the opportunity to feel the curves of her body slide past. Once on her feet again, she smoothed her clothing and collected herself. I will not let fear control me, she told herself. I will not. It was fine to be afraid of the maniac with the machete who was prowling around out there somewhere, and of the so-called man of God standing before her. But of God himself, no. She loved him, as her parents always taught her to do. She would never discover what made her mom and dad believe in Father Long. Maybe it was simply that they were old and had begun to fear death so much that they were desperate for assurances that they'd make it to heaven. And they saw that in Long. She could forgive their mistake. But these people here in front of her, after everything they'd seen that night, still hanging on Long's every word, still believing he offered some sort of salvation, they deserved no forgiveness. They were just stupid. We could leave, you know, Meredith said calmly. Scowling, Father Long stopped pacing, annoyed at the girl's words. I am speaking, young lady. She ignored him. We could just get in the bus and go, everyone. Rickles laid a hand on her shoulder, pulling gently at her. Meredith, please. She shrugged his hand away and took a step forward, out of reach. I'm not trying to fight or, or cause problems, she continued. I just think the, the smart thing is to get away from here. We have to tell someone what happened. We, we have to report the murders. Murders? Long snorted. Shut up, Patricia Crinkle suddenly blurted. The woman stared angrily at Meredith. I'm sick of your disrespect and your blasphemy. Meredith looked at the woman in disbelief. Are you fucking insane? Patricia leapt to her feet, her face twisting. You should have been judged. You shouldn't even be here. Mr. Rickles, Long said, his implication quite obvious. 
You should have been chopped up back there with the other sinners, Crinkle screamed. Meredith was dumbstruck. Curtis Rickles stepped up behind her, taking her hand. Meredith, darling, please, this isn't helping anyone. She looked up at the man, tears welling in her eyes. I just want to leave, she whispered. I want us all to leave. Just go someplace safe, somewhere where we can all be safe. We can't do that, honey. We can't leave. But I can promise you, I'll keep you safe right here. How can you even say that, she wanted to ask. She struggled to bring the words up, give them voice, but she no longer had the strength. Wearily, Meredith leaned her head forward, resting it on Rickles' chest. He still smelled like piss, and he still gave her the creeps, but she felt like he was the only one on her side. You all heard that, did you not? Long said, sermonizing again. You heard the words coming from that young woman's mouth. He began to pace once more. That is the voice of fear. Fear is an instrument of evil. He was twisting things around, taking what she said and using it to further his own ends. I'm not saying to you that this girl is evil. No, on the contrary, she can be saved. I still believe she can meet the vessel and pass his glorious judgment. It's the fear that is evil, insidious. You mustn't fear the vessel. He is an instrument of salvation. Long smacked his fist into his open palm, punctuating each word as he spoke it. Of love. His eyes traveled across the rapt faces of his flock. An instrument of the love that God has for each and every one of us and for all of his creation. Long turned to look at Meredith, her face still buried in Rickle's chest. The man's wounded arm encircling her. A tiny smile played across Long's face. Please, please do not fear that. Shut up, Meredith thought. Shut up. I can't take any more of this. Turning, turning. Long smile faded, replaced by a somber expression. What we need to fear, he told his followers, are those who would take the vessel from us, usurp the Lord's almighty authority. Why do you think those soldiers were here this afternoon, hmm? He played the question to the group, looking around, waiting for an answer. Do you think they were here to make sure our lease was in order, or perhaps to see that we had adequate indoor plumbing? The father sighed, his eyes closing wearily. No, they have come to sever the hand of God, to take away everything that we have worked for, everything we've sacrificed for, everything we have suffered for. Damn them, Susan Perkins yelled, then looked around her with embarrassment. Father Long pointed at the woman. Yes, damn them. That's just what the heavenly vessel will do. But we cannot simply sit back and allow it all to play out. Not when we've struggled for so long. He shot a meaningful glance at Rickles. This, this time, the time has come for the faithful to defend what is right. To defend what is ours. His fist clenched tightly, shuddering, the knuckles whitening. To defend the very will of our Lord. Long heaved a deep breath. If that means laying down our lives, well, then that, too, is the Lord's will. Long looked around the room. The congregation was, des was deathly silent, awestruck at the words the preacher had spoken. Meredith collapsed fully against Rickles, unable to bear the weight of it all any longer. How could she fight it? She was just a little girl, after all, just a naive little girl. Rickles' embrace tightened around Meredith's limp body. It's all going to be okay, he promised her. I know, she whispered. I know. Townsend ordered Seaver to halt the lab off the highway, out of sight of the two-lane road, but still some distance away from Camp Crystal Lake at the same time. He had originally intended to simply roll into the camp, kicking up God's own noise and stirring up everything within a thousand yards of the place. But then he started wondering, would Jason Voorhees have the sense to get the hell out of there if something like that rolled into his favorite woodland retreat? The psycho freak sure as hell knew these woods better than the strike team did. They might never track him down. Better to park out here and hoof it. 
Who knew? Maybe a, maybe a handful of tempting machete fodder would draw the killer out, and they could square off with him sooner rather than later. Yeah. Then Townsend could wrap this thing up and deliver Walter Hobb back to Lauren, so the woman could have a moment's peace. He had thought he was doing Hobb a favor, but more and more Townsend was beginning to feel like it had been a huge mistake to ask Walter to join the team, to take him away from his home and his wife again. It might not have been the most desirable way to leave the agency, but Walt had stumbled onto a way out, even if it was forced on him. Shit, Townsend knew that was the only way he'd get out himself. And in the days since, he'd been handed this command. He'd begun to think that maybe getting out was goddamn appealing. He just wasn't sure he had the balls to walk out and quit. What would he do with himself? Various scenarios had played through his mind, but nothing seemed right. He supposed he could take a shot at being a private investigator, put his training to use that way, or he could just go get himself a job as a bouncer at the fancy titty bar outside of town. Not having the luxury of a girlfriend, though, a job like that could wind up being real depressing. Staring at sexy gals all night and going home to an empty apartment? Probably a bad idea. No doubt about it, Walt had been given a beautiful opportunity to leave all this behind, and Townsend had to go screw it all up. Lauren would probably never speak to him again. Townsend was jarred from his thoughts off of early retirement as Seaver pulled the lab off the dirt road, the right side of the vehicle's hefty nose clipping the sign that read Camp Crystal Lake, with the words, Home of the Ministry of the Heavenly Vessel, painted beneath. The sign toppled, splintering under the armored transport's huge tires. Oops, Seaver said. The rear hatch opened, dropping downwards to create a ramp. In formation, the team disembarked from the vehicle, Townsend in the lead, gripping his beloved shotgun. Chris Seaver strode cockily down the ramp after them. Seal it up, Townsend whispered. Seaver complied, closing the lav's hatch. Turning to join the others, he fired up the laser sight on his FN MK-46 and flicked his night vision goggles down. The operators all wore radio headsets, but the entire goddamn area around Crystal Lake seemed to be a giant black hole as far as radio was concerned, and the things were all but useless. The 15 operators had taken up defensive positions around the armored transport, each keeping an eye on the area of responsibility that they were given. The moon had disappeared behind cloud cover, leaving the area as dark as hell. Townsend gazed around the perimeter, the green display of his night vision goggles revealing thick forests surrounding them. The big son of a bitch could, could have been anywhere out there. Townsend clucked out a soft signal to the strike team and they began moving forward at a quick pace, weapons leveled in front of them. Noon and Stilton brought up the rear, walking backwards to provide cover in that direction. The team moved with surprising quietness, only the occasional twig snapping beneath a boot to give away their presence. How does a guy wind up leading an assault on Camp Crystal Lake to bring down Jason Voorhees, for Christ's sake? Townsend felt like he was on another planet. It was bizarre. Then it struck him. How the hell did he wind up with this command? This was a showpiece operation for the agency. He felt they would have put someone with more command experience in the top slot, left him in his, in, in his familiar position, if they put him on the team at all. Townsend's heart leapt into his throat. Unless the agency was cleaning house, had he been set up to take a big bloody fall? Holy shit! The only member of the strike team that he'd handpicked was Walter Hobb. The others were assigned by the agency, and every last one of them had some kind of blemish on their record. Or were a loudmouth like Townsend had been over the screwed meth lab raid and the agency's treatment of Hobb. And thinking back on it, perhaps the agency had caved in a little too quickly to his request that Hobb be a part of the team. Was a strike team on a suicide mission? Something the agency came up with to rid themselves of a few problem children? Townsend suddenly found himself wishing that the radio headsets worked a little better. He tapped the tiny microphone that curled out from his helmet. He needed to share this notion with Walt, see if his buddy thought he had lost his freaking mind. Matter of fact, maybe it would be a good idea to postpone this little raid, head back to base camp and talk some shit over. Movement to the left, something darting between a tree. Several guns, including Townsend's, whipped in that direction. Fifteen operators held their breath. About four feet up, a dark shape protruded from beneath the left side of the tree trunk. Somebody wasn't doing a very good job of hiding. The shape moved slightly. Wait for it. The shape crawled around to the front of the tree, fat and furry. What the hell is that thing? Noon whispered. Raccoon, Townsend said. The fuzzy little beast was staring right at him. 
glowing eyes peering from within its black mask. Everybody breathed again. Then, Jason Voorhees stepped into Chris Seaver's path, raising his machete. Seaver had the chance to fire three rounds, all of them kicking up dirt and leaves a few yards behind the masked murderer. Then the machete blade came down, splitting Seaver's night vision goggles and the screaming face beneath it. Samantha Noon whirled just in time to see the gouts of blood spurting upwards from Seaver's face, the fluid tinted green by the night vision effect. No! She howled, elbowing her way through the others. Townsend tried to draw down on the madman with his shotgun. Everything was a flashing frenzy of green shapes. Jason was right in the middle of them. There was no way to get a clear shot without risking taking down one of the operators. Someone fired a couple rounds. Someone else cried out in anguish. Townsend saw a bright flash as Jason's machete lashed out again, laying Blair's thigh open to the bone. Blood gushing, the man dropped to the dirt, clutching his leg. The hockey mask glowed in Townsend's goggles. He had a clear shot. Just as the big man pulled the trigger, Noon shoved past him, and he put the load of buckshot into a tree, kicking up bits of wood and bark. Then Seaver's twitching body fell in front of him. The man was trying to scream, but... Everything above his lower jaw was split wide open, cleaved all the way back to his soft palate. He was gargling on his own blood, spitting out flesh. Sporadic gunfire and more screams. Townsend was sure he saw slugs impacting in the killer's torso, hammering him backwards. But the goddamn machete continued hacking and slashing through the team. Somebody else went down, their head landing a few feet away. Townsend heard Noon curse and saw her weapon spit fire. Jason took a swipe at her, the machete blade glancing off of her Kevlar helmet. The impact dropped her to the dirt. As Jason raised his machete for the killing blow, Townsend put a round of double-up buck into his chest. The killer staggered back away from the team. Suddenly, gunfire erupted all around Townsend as the strike team finally had a clear shot at their attacker. Amplified by his night vision goggles, the muzzle flashes were blinding. Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! Townsend yelled. The gunfire ceased. Through the drifting haze of gunpowder smoke, Townsend could see nothing. Jason was gone. Four operators were down. Blair was the only one of those still moving. Circle up, Townsend ordered. What was left of the strike team rapidly formed a tight circle around their fallen comrades, weapons trained on the dark woods that enveloped them. Call it off, Townsend barked. Immediately, the team members rattled off their names in sequence. No response from Seaver, Miller, or Hall. Blair was making all kinds of noise, so Townsend checked him off on the survivor column, for the moment at least. Mosley, a young guy who looked like he might have shit his pants just a little, hurried forward and knelt alongside Blair, withdrawing an inch-wide zip tie from a vest pocket. Mosley quickly began wrapping around Blair's injured leg to serve as a tourniquet. Pushing her night vision goggles up on her head, Samantha Noon went to Chris Seaver's side. His twitching had stopped. So had the gargling. The blood was overflowing from his dead mouth and spilling into the dirt. Motherfucker, Noon hissed. It was about the most romantic thing the woman could have said. Blair was gasping and moaning, rocking back and forth and gripping his bleeding leg. Move your hands, Mosley told him. Move them. I can't tighten this thing with your fingers in the way. Relenting, Blair released his hold on the leg. The blood flow instantly increased, bubbling out like a garden fountain. Oh, shit! He moaned softly. Mosley hurriedly tightened the zip tie and locked it off. I'm hit, Stilton said. Townsend moved to check out the man's wounds. Stilton painfully lifted his right arm. The sleeve of his uniform was torn open and bloody. I, I don't think it's bad, Stilton said optimistically. Townsend examined the wound. Hurts like a son of a bitch, though, doesn't it? Stilton nodded. Mosley, when you're done with that, here's another one for you, Townsend said. A minute, Mosley answered. Press down on it for now. Townsend took a firm grip on Stilton's wound and applied pressure. As he watched the blood trickle through his fingers, Townsend weighed the possibilities. Was it a setup? If so, the agency had already cleared out a pretty good number of the troublemakers. Samantha Noon stepped up in front of him glowering at him like a pissed-off lioness. We need to keep moving, Townsend told her. See what went down at Camp Crystal Lake. What he had wanted to say was, let's get the hell back to base camp. I think we've been ass raped by our bosses. But he still didn't feel certain enough about his concerns to voice them to the others. Fuck all those stupid Jesus freaks. Far as I'm concerned, whatever happened, they got what was coming to them. 
I can't help but agree with you, but that isn't the point. We've got a job to do. Noon sneered. That job just ran the fuck off into the bushes after killing three of us. We need to be on that motherfucker's ass like the coyote on the roadrunner. That's a really bad analogy, Noon. Shit didn't exactly ever work out for the coyote, Townsend pointed at. Whatever. All I'm saying is, I know what you're saying, Townsend interrupted. He realized he was squeezing Tilton's arm a little too tightly. The whole team was tensed up, scared as hell but not willing to admit it. He didn't need Noon crawling up his ass to add to his problems. And when you're in charge, we'll be the coyote. But right now, we're going to be the guys who go into Camp Crystal Lake to see what the fucking situation is. Clear? Frowning, Noon watched as Mosley hustled up and took over dealing with Stilton's gunshot. As Townsend released his grip on the man's arm, blood gushed from the wound, spattering the ground. Is that clear? Townsend repeated, wiping his hands on his pants. Clear, Noon snapped. Satisfied, Townsend called back over his shoulder. Blair! Still with ya. Can you move? I sure as hell ain't staying here, the man said. But I can guarantee I won't slow you down, sir. Townsend turned to look at Stilton. Mosley had cut the man's sleeve open and begun treating his bullet wound. It was pretty bad. The MK-46 delivered some hellish stopping power, and Stilton had taken the round at close range. How's it look, Mosley? The medic continued to work as he replied. I, I think I can fix it. Good man, Stilton. Mosley, I want you two to take Blair back to the lab. Mosley looked stricken. By ourselves? I'm the only one who wasn't wounded. What What if Jason... Sisson, we'll go with you, Townsend said, annoyed by understanding Mosley's concerns. Fuck, Sisson said, short and bulky. Sisson looked like a cartoon armadillo in his body armor and protective gear. He, car he carried a Milcor 40mm grenade launcher. The fat ammo cylinder cradled against his belly. I didn't even get a shot off during that rumble. Well, maybe you'll get lucky on your way back to the lab, Townsend said snidely. Let's hope not, Mosley muttered, continuing to fuss with Stilton's wounded arm. Hoping like hell he was wrong about the agency, Townsend rounded up the others and set out for Camp Crystal Lake. The sound of gunfire in the distance drove Hobb to his feet in the crew department of the lab. Sounds like they found themselves a target, Atchison said, grinning. Hell, we might be going home tonight. The sporadic distant popping suddenly increased wildly. Then just as quickly faded away to nothing. Hobb looked at Kelly. The girl's eyes were clamped shut and she was nibbling on her lower lip. Everyone was silent and listening intently. Several moments passed without any more gunfire. Mr. Jason Voorhees, meet Mr. Superior Firepower. Bruno Ortega swapped a high five with Hurley. Hobb wished he could share Ortega's confidence. Damn it, he should have been out there. Or he shouldn't have been there at all. He wasn't sure which. With the amount of respect he commanded from his fellow operators, he'd almost be better off working, working the grill at White Castle. Useless. He felt useless. And that was the one thing he couldn't tolerate. Why hasn't Towson radioed in? Hobbs said. Were you taking a piss or something when we tested the headsets? You know the radio doesn't work for shit out here, Atchison said. Hobb gritted his teeth. Shit. He'd forgotten, all, he'd forgotten all about that. And now he looked like an even bigger dumbass. Besides, what's the point? Ortega stretched out on the floor, trying to get comfortable. They're going to roll back in here with Jason tied to the hood of that lab like a goddamn deer, man. Or maybe they're all lying in pools of their own blood, Hobb thought. Yeah, and if the radios did work, those pussies would just be calling in wanting us to do the heavy lifting, Hurley said smirking, asking for help from the real heroes. That's us, Ortega said, his eyes closed. Maybe we should head over there, Hobbs suggested. A couple of us could stay here in the other lab while the others go check things out. Why create unnecessary work? Hurley shook his head. You're letting this chick's stories go to your head. I'm telling you, with the firepower those boys are carrying, they could bring down King fucking Kong. Jason Voorhees doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell. Hobbs sat down again next to Kelly. I hope you're right. Ortega raised his head and opened one eye to look at Hobb. Dude, you worry, like way too much. Exhausted by the effort he'd expended, Ortega lowered his head again. Just think about what they're up against, for Christ's sake. Hobb caught Kelly staring at him. Her expression told him she was thinking the same thing.
Okay. This has been Friday the 13th, Church of the Divine Psychopath, chapters 9 and 10. We're about halfway through the book now, so we're, we're getting to the home stretch. I just want to remind everybody to uh, like, comment, and subscribe. We are at 72 subscribers. If we can get to 100 before I finish reading this book, then I will select a subscriber based on comments left in the videos. And I will send them my copy that I'm reading right now to y'all of Church of the Vine Psychopath. I will send it to them for free as a gift. I hope you all enjoyed. Tune in tomorrow. I'll have some more chapters. Don't forget to click the bell so you'll know exactly when those chapters are uploaded. Thank you and have a great night.